this is going to be maximize, maximizing your workout for fat loss. We're talking fat loss specifically today, but a lot of the principles that I talk about can actually be used for any sort of fitness goal that you have. Um, again, Tim Arndt, uh, I have a fitness and exercise science degree. I graduated from Western Washington University. I'm a certified strength and conditioning specialist. And my pride and joy here is the resistance training specialist master this whole RTSM thing which nobody knows about. Um, <clears throat> that is probably the most intensive biomechanics um, and motor learning control certification that you can get. And it's super expensive so nobody has it. And you have to go to Oklahoma City uh, for about six months straight to, to get that kind of thing. Um, so I'm a fitness educator and personal trainer. I've been in the industry for about 10 years and uh, really kind of working into you know doing seminars like this and uh, all that kind of stuff so you can find more information at matrixfited.com it's not matrix fighted we're not a fight club here um, so if you want more information about what I do and uh, I have a weekly blog that you can check out that has information that you can take and, and use right away um, so go ahead and check that out so let's go ahead and get started Let's have some fun. Uh, you can tell this cat here, he's thrilled to be here, right? Um, either that or you can call him uh, Benny the Neck. And if you don't have fun, he's going to get you. Um, so first thing we're going to talk about is planning to succeed. Um, I have a little story that I want to read to you. There's two questions I want you to keep in your mind while I'm reading it. What did the 95 do, uh, fail to do? And then what did the five, what, what was the reason for the success of the five? Okay, so keep those two questions in mind as I go through this. And I have this memorized, right? It's all right here on piece of paper. Um, imagine you were given the job of chopping down a giant oak tree. So a huge, huge oak tree. And they say, chop it down now. This, for most people, is the abyss of fat loss, where they're like, this, this goal that I have, I need to lose 100 pounds, it's so far out there, I don't even want to try it because I know I'm going to fail. That's how it is for many, many people, many of the clients I've worked with. So, back to the story, you were given no tools and no other instructions, just chop down the tree. And when you do, you'll be successful. What would you do first? Well, statistically, we know that 95 out of 100 people would go and find an ax and get to work. The 95, or the masses, the majority of people, thoughtlessly run out into the forest with a herd mentality, wielding a rusty old axe, while five out of the hundred have the wisdom and patience to take some time to sharpen their axe. So what they're doing is they plan, they're planning, which allows us to streamline the process from getting from point A to point B, whether it's 10 pounds, whether it's 100 pounds. Immediately, mangled wood chips start flying everywhere. Within minutes, men and women begin looking over their shoulders to check the progress of their neighbor. Some begin to look desperate as they see others outperforming them. So they step up their game. They swing faster and harder. Bam! 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 Many become winded. Others drop their axe, examine their word sensation, their, their feeling on their hand. They're starting to get some blisters. Now, for many of us who start working out without really planning out what we're going to do, we just, we just go ahead and start moving. Like, uh, if you've ever seen Dr. Phil and his take on exercise, just get one step in front of the other and gain forward momentum, right? He doesn't talk anything about the planning. <clears throat> These nagging injuries are avoidable and should be avoided. And that's where biomechanics comes into play. Meanwhile, some of the five who went into the shed to sharpen their axe start showing up poised, dignified, relaxed, but determined. They swing the axe smoothly and with the very first blow, boom, remove a large chunk of the tree. Immediately, some of the 95 start sneering as they can see they will be passed up by the new guy in a matter of minutes. Then the trash talk starts. The 95 out of a uh, talk of his shirt, his hair, his body, and even his axe anything to keep their minds off the fact that he is winning and they are losing. So this can kind of be sometimes uh, if we start to put a new thing in our lives such as working out and we're, we're committed to it, you have some friends who might be in the same situation as you and they either get jealous or start making comments like you're obsessed. You know, you need to stop worrying so much about that. All that's vanity, you know. Uh, people can start to kind of, it's kind of like the crab mentality. If you put a bucket of crabs in, one tries to get out, the other ones pull it right back down. 
Um, <clears throat> I think they call it the black crab mentality here. So in a very short time, the five catch the 95, and the 95 become very competitive and even desperate. They swing their axes with their whole bodies, pounding away at the oak. Soon, many of the 95 are sitting down in the shade, panting like driven dogs, pretending to be wounded so as to excuse their idleness. So if you start working out and you're not seeing the results you want, you start to come up with excuses so it's okay to quit. Others really are wounded. One woman feels something wet and warm running through her fingers. The axe handle has become slippery. She doesn't want to look, but it hurts so bad that she must. They're blisters, and they popped, and now they're bleeding. Others experience the same thing. Some push through the pain, but only for a little while. So these nagging injuries that we ignore, or we push through the no pain, no gain mentality, these nagging injuries can become very serious. And these are the ones that are the most serious. Uh, think about arthritis. Um, does anybody here have arthritis? Um, you know, if you do, do you enjoy it? You know, probably not. The scarier thing is you never know that you are doing this to yourself until it's too late. And there's no cure for arthritis as of yet. So fights begin to break out. The 95 are worn out, angry, jealous, and confused. The pandemonium comes to a brief halt. One of the five is finished. Seemingly in slow motion, her tree falls gracefully to the floor. Instead of celebration, though, there are grumblings. The 95 start blaming. They're blaming their axe, blaming the five, blaming the first, and blaming each other. Few of the 95 are dead set on finishing the task. They flail wildly out of, out of control, snorting and grunting. Another of the five finishes, and another, and another, and another. They're all done as just as they had begun to break a sweat. It's early in the day, yet they are done with their work and returning home to be with their families. So, what did the 95 fail to do? They failed to plan, right? Okay, they just went out and started moving. What was the reason for the success of the five? Obviously, they decided to plan. They, they made a plan. Sharpen your axe. Before you do anything, you need to sharpen. That's the first step to fat loss success or, or workout success, fitness success. Spend time planning for your fitness success. Abraham Lincoln agrees. It's been said that Abraham Lincoln said if he had six hours to chop down a tree, he's going to spend four hours sharpening his axe. Important fit factors. So these are things things that we're going to, uh, a couple of them we're going to dive into pretty deeply. Uh, a couple of them we're just going to touch because we don't have six hours to spend on these things. The first two, there are no surprises. For fat loss success, you got to have proper nutrition and you do have to exercise once you've made your plan, right? Sleep is also another big one, so don't overlook this. It's hugely important to your results. Um, the Center of Disease Control recommends seven to nine hours. I prefer ten, um, although I never get. I got two kids, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm good with seven these days. Um, but that's when our body recovers. Now, working out is a stress to our body. When you're working out, no matter what you're doing, weights, cardio, swimming, whatever it is, you, your body's saying, "What are you doing to me?" You know, and. When you sleep, that's when it's saying, okay, we're going to make this change now. So that could be you know, fat loss, muscle gain, increased bone density, a lot of change, hormonal changes too, um, happening when we're sleeping. And our body does need at least seven hours of sleep to make all those changes appropriately. And that's for other factors too, such as stress and all that. Speaking of stress, this is also huge. It's the silent killer. Um, <clears throat> executives. This is their problem. They're so stressed out from their job, they're having heart attacks at 45, 50 years old. It isn't because they're eating bad. A lot of them fail to even eat. I come from uh, corporate wellness. I worked at Nautilus for years. And a lot of the executives would buy personal training from me and never, never show up. And I was just downstairs. And uh, the reason why is because they're stressed out from their jobs, feeling like if they got up from, from their desk, even for 15 minutes, they would fall so far behind they could never catch back up. I've also seen slides of, of arteries. Someone who's healthy has no plaque on their veins compared to someone who has a, a really bad diet and there's plaque in the, in the veins. You can see it, it's, it's pretty bad. And then they compare that to somebody who is stressed out but perhaps doesn't have such a bad diet and it was twice as bad as somebody who, who had even just a bad diet. 
So stress is huge, and if you, you got to find ways to control that. Genetics. We all have a genetic profile, and so the big thing for us is we want to maximize your potential or my potential, whoever we are. Okay. Compare yourself to yourself. Um, when you start working out, do you feel better than you did before? Do you you know, look better than you did before. It's just you. You know, if you compare yourself to other people, you're actually comparing apples and oranges. You compare yourself to yourself, and then it's apples to apples. So nutrition. Um, I'm going to touch briefly on this because it is important. But um, <clears throat> my take on this is keep it simple, silly buns, right? Um, it actually should be kiss but right? Um, it never gets any more difficult than calories in versus calories out. Eat less calories than you burn in a day. You're gonna lose some weight. Um, I put duh cause it, it, and with a question mark because even though it isn't any more difficult than that, a lot of us still don't get it. Um, take the Twinkie <coughs> diet for instance. Mark Hobb, who's a nutrition professor at Kansas State University, maybe you guys have heard of this, for 10 weeks, all he ate was junk food. Uh, a large majority of that was, was uh, Twinkies. And after 10 weeks, he lost 27 pounds. Um, his cholesterol levels improved. And, you know, overall, he was a much healthier person, which is kind of crazy. Um, I don't recommend that, but it's just, he did it just to prove a point. I wonder how he actually felt, like what his energy levels and things like that were during that time. So how can we create a caloric deficit? It, uh, there's two things. We can exercise more or we can eat less, right? And if you like food like me, I prefer to exercise more. Um, and that also allows me to drink more beer because I, I like beer quite a bit. Um, so it, it really, those are the two things. So we have calories in um, and calories out. So how can we make that deficit? We can exercise more. We could eat less. Perhaps we could do a little of both. Now, is there an ideal deficit? A pound, consider a pound of fat has 3,500 calories in it. If you have a 500 calorie deficit per day, it'll take you one week to lose one pound of fat. So it's a good general rule to go on, and that's typically what I recommend to most of my clients. However, for more aggressive goals, you can have about a 1,000 calorie uh, per day deficit. I don't recommend keeping that up for too long, and I don't recommend going much above that, especially for any extended period of time. Um, an example was for myself, I, um, I, I just recently lost about 25 pounds, and I had a target goal, which wasn't too far out. I had six weeks, I had my 15 year class reunion, and for myself, I was out of shape, and I didn't want people to see me that way. So over six weeks, I probably had about a you know, 1,200 uh, calorie per day deficit, not on a daily basis, probably about three or four times a week though. More on nutrition here. <clears throat> so how important is eating proper foods? Well, Aaron Koo is a registered, di registered dietitian at Total Balance Wellness. Um, on her website, totalbalancewellness.com, I love this quote because it, it sums it up perfectly. It says, Food is one of the most powerful substances to humans. It can cause disease and even death. At the same time, can be instrumental in preventing and curing illness. So it's pretty powerful. It's a, it's a powerful thing. Food can kill you or it can save your life. So it is important that we know what we're putting into our bodies and what we're doing with, what, with our nutrition. If you need more specifics, consult a registered dietitian or a certified clinical nutritionist. So what you're looking for is that RD and that CCN thing right there. Um, those people know what they're talking about. They have, they've passed stringent tests, spent countless hours studying this stuff, um, and they're your best bet to go for. Don't be fooled by personal trainers. I'm a personal trainer myself, okay? A lot of trainers think I passed a certification that included this much nutrition, so I should know everything. However, if you look at a trainer's scope of practice, it is outside of the boundaries of what they're supposed to do. Now we can help saying, don't eat McDonald's. That's probably good advice, right? Eat some fruits and vegetables, things like that. But if you're looking for a specific meal plan, um, you know, you're looking for specific supplements to take for yourself, you really need to consult a, an RD or a CCN. There are other nutrition certifications out there that 
are similar to personal training certifications where you can order some materials, study for about three months, and, and pass that test. If you really want to go for the gold, you, you need to look for the RD or the CCN. Let's get into the fun stuff, which is exercise, the stuff I like. Talk about, there's three important factors here, okay? One is intensity. Now this is a big one, and I'm gonna go pretty in depth in about intensity, how important it is. So by the end of this, you should have that ingrained in your head. Consistency, obviously we need to show up in order to be able to gain results. And the other is motivation. This guy here is being chased by a dinosaur, so I think that's a pretty good reason to get up and move. Um, you gotta find out for yourself what that dinosaur is. What's your motivation? And get specific about it too because it's not specific enough or motivating enough really to say, I wanna lose 10 pounds, okay? Or 20 pounds, whatever it is. Why? Why do you wanna do this? That's the important thing. What's this 10 pounds gonna do for you or this 50 pounds, whatever? Is it like, like uh, one example, uh, I think it's a good example. I had a client come to me one, one time and, and she was a bigger lady. She needed to lose about 70 pounds. She said, I want to shop in the women's department. I said, well, that, that's interesting. Why don't you do that now? She goes, because the guy's clothes are bigger and they hide my body and it makes me feel more comfortable. But uh, uh, clothes shopping is a horrific experience for this lady. Um, so this, you know, 70 pounds later, she calls me up, crying on the phone, saying, I'm in the women's section. You know, she wasn't in the juniors yet, but at least she was in the women's section. Now, shopping wasn't such a horrific ordeal for her. So find out what this dinosaur is for you, that the motivation to want to get up and move. Talking about intensity, if you ever need a picture of what intensity looks like, this picture right here, that's it. Everybody take a look at that. That girl looks like that tennis ball is going to have some problems. I feel sorry for it. This is the biggest factor for increasing metabolism, which is the big, it, it's huge. As you guys are sitting here right now, you want to increase metabolism so that you burn more calories as you're sitting here listening to me. So what about the fat burning zone? Because we always hear that. If you want to burn more fat calories, work out in the fat burning zone, right? Have you guys all heard that? Um, well, all I can tell you is forget about it. It is, is worthless. We'll kind of go over why here in a second, but right now, just get it out of your mind. The bigger deal, is it the calories you burn while you work out, or is it the other 23 hours of the day, or 23 and a half hours of the day? When do you want to be burning at a higher rate? So when you're working out and you say, how many calories did I burn out in the, burn in this workout? Well, it, it might be 600, but so what? If you don't burn many calories throughout the rest of the day, nothing's really going to change. So when you work out, what you're trying to affect is how many calories you're burning while you're driving, while you're sleeping, while you're sitting here watching me, uh, watching TV, all those things. And this is the intensity, having a high intensity workout is going to do that for you. So we're going to have a little battle. It's going to be low intensity versus high intensity. And so uh, the orange cat's going to win because he looks just like my cat. Um, and I'm a huge Packers fan, so his name is Packer. Um, so let's go orange cat. Okay, so let's talk about low intensity. Your fat burning zone is typically about 60% of your maximum heart rate. And at that point, you're burning about 50% of fat and 50% carbs for your energy, which equals to about 8 calories per minute. And after an hour of exercise, you burn a total of 480 calories, and that's 240 calories coming from fat. Not too bad. But how does high intensity compare? 80% of your maximum heart rate, so working 20% harder. It's not necessarily super high intensity, but it is higher. And at that rate, you're going to burn less calories from fat, percentage-wise, uh, at 40 and 60% carbs. However, it does increase the amount of calories you're expending to about 11 calories per minute. So over an hour, you burn 640 total calories, which I think is like 160 more calories. And it's 264 of those calories come from fat. So even though we burn a less percentage, we actually burn more calories from fat overall. So when it comes down, oh, when it comes down to it, if you want to look kind of how this training works for you, you have 
the, mar the marathon runners who are kind of skinny, they're in shape, um, but their body fat percentages are a lot higher relative to this guy who does high intensity stuff, you know, sprinting 100 meters, sprinting 200 meters and resting, things like that. Um, who would you rather look like? Now, before you jump out of your seat, what I'm not saying is you don't have to look like this guy, okay? Or nor do you have to look like these guys. There's a continuum in between these. Which side of the line do you want to be closer to? Um, if you're looking for fat loss, looking for muscle tone, you're going to have to train like this guy. If you want to uh, run long distances because you like it or because you're going to run a triathlon or a marathon, a competition, you're going to have to train like these guys. Now, these guys are built and in shape for their particular sport. They, they are correctly built for that. Um, however, when it comes to what we see in the mirror, we should mimic our training compared to who we want to look more like. Every time I put that up, I go, oh, no, I don't want to look like that guy. He's too buff. You know, he's too ripped. I, I don't, I, what I'm really hearing is I could never look like that, so I'm not even going to try. Okay, that's fine. You don't have to look like that. You may never look like that. But if you want to look closer to that, you need to train like them. So when it comes down to it, high intensity wins. It looks like the other cat won, but my orange cat disappeared for some reason. <clears throat> I have a question. Go ahead. Um, as far as burning a higher percentage of fat, um, how about if before you work out, you fast for like six or eight hours? That's going to be really hard to, to work out if, you, if you're fasting without any energy left in your body. I, I've been doing it. It, it's Ori Hoffmacher's system. I've been reading up on it. Mm -hmm. In fact, we've, we've both been doing it to some degree. Yep. Um, you're supposed to fast all night and work out first thing in the morning. We haven't done that, but, but we do you know, skip eating for like maybe six hours mm -hmm. and, and then work out. But I've never seen any percentages. You know, yeah. It, that might actually yeah. Do. The, uh, what you're going to have to be careful with is, is your energy levels and how you feel while you're doing that. Because as soon as your muscle glycogen levels leave you, leave your muscles and your liver, you're going to go, right? Your battery is going to start wearing out really fast if you're, doing high, if you're doing high intensity exercise for an extended period of time. Now, if it's short bursts, like say you're doing it for 15, maybe 20 minutes, you'll probably be okay. If you're doing long drawn out stuff and you actually are using your fat calories, you know, more, more aggressively that way, you're still going to have to spend 45, 50 minutes to, to get a, a good effect out of it. So it, it's, you have to be careful of how you feel and your energy levels. And the big thing is people who have done that and not paid attention to that, you know, they'll get shaky, they'll get sick, oh, yeah. perhaps even pass out. So you just got to be careful with those things. So high intensity interval training. Now, as far as I'm concerned, this is the magic pill to fat loss. If you want to, you know, kind of do the, the red pill or the, 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 what is it, the blue pill or the red pill like on Matrix, and the red pill is like, okay, I get my fat loss here real fast. That's, this is high intensity interval training. The great thing about this is it does have a 72 hour metabolic effect. And so if you spend 30 minutes doing high intensity interval training for the next three days, you're going to be, as you're sitting here, you know, driving, watching TV, all that kind of stuff, you're going to be burning more calories than you did, would if you had done, say, a 45 minute jog. And research backs that up pretty heavily. However, it must be done maximally, and we're going to talk pretty extensively about that. Um, it's exhausting, I know. When you're done, you should feel like this polar bear here. That polar bear looks like he's pretty darn exhausted. That's how you should feel. Well, we've tried that, and we do feel that way, but within like 15 minutes after we're done, we feel great. Just yeah, because we have absolutely, and like, that means it's working. Because yeah. what the big thing you want to be uh, concerned about is how long does it take you to recover? You know, when you first do it, especially if you're, you know, haven't been working out for a while, it might take you 45 minutes to feel that way. But, it, you know, like now I can, I can burn myself to the ground and, you know, five, ten minutes later I'm, I'm pretty normal again. So that's good. Um, spot reduction. Now there's new research that shows, well, let me back up here a little bit. I've often, often, often been asked, and repeatedly by the same person, how do I lose this fat right here? 
right? And so my answer, because what they're looking for is do a thousand crunches a day, you'll come out with a six pack in six weeks. Now, imagine this, imagine you do a thousand crunches a day and, and you know, you have lots of fat to lose over wealth, but all of a sudden you end up with a six pack six weeks later and everything else looks the same. It would look kind of odd, right? So spot reduction really isn't possible, but the closest thing we can get to spot reduction is through high intensity interval training. There's actually some research out there now that shows it prefers belly fat versus anything else. Doesn't mean it's only gonna get it from belly fat, but a higher percentage of the fat calories it uses will come from belly fat. So don't get too excited, but it is kind of cool. So how do you do it? Interval training is defined by periods of fast and then periods of slow, and then you go fast, and then you go slow, okay? Um, when you, the slow periods are kind of your recovery. Now, it should be 30 seconds to two minutes, approximately in there. Sometimes it'll take you more if you're new at it. But only do enough to recover. So if you recover in 30 seconds, don't wait two minutes to get going again. Get going right away. Uh, the sprints or the fast periods, 30 seconds to a minute. Um, you should be totally exhausted when you're done. Like by the time you're done, you know, you can't catch your breath. You're weed like <laughs> Okay, that's what it should be like. I mean, I'm exaggerating, I know it, but that's really kind of what you're looking for. Physiologically, if you're doing 100% maximal effort, it is almost impossible to keep it up for more than 30 seconds. So that's what you're looking for. Is, it, is going 100% easy? No, you know, why is that? Humans are lazy. I mean, why aren't you guys standing right now? You know, you're sitting down and some of you guys are sitting down there like, oh man, I would be. Like, I'd, rather, I'd rather stand here like this and talk to you guys, you know. Um, we, our body naturally wants to go to the easiest position or easiest route or whatever it is it wants it wants to be efficient with everything so the question is can you even go a hundred percent it's kind of a trick question because think about it if you literally spent a hundred percent of your physical energy you, you probably pass out or you, you might die you, you probably pass out before your body allowed you to do that the closest example I can come to that is, is like uh, some of the um, you know, Olympic rowers or even marathon runners who, who have pushed themselves so hard that they can't even stand. You've probably seen videos of that, you know, this lady going like this trying to cross the finish line and they, you know, perhaps even lost control of their bowel movements. Um, that takes some serious mental effort. Typically, our breaking point is going to be mentally before physically, but that's okay. Um, it, it's actually a protective mechanism, totally okay. So how do you know if your intensity is right? Have no fear, RPE is here. So what the heck is RPE, right? Simply, it's just a scale of, of how, what your rate of perceived exertion is. That's what RPE is. Um, they have a technical scale that I think ranges between like four and 18. Uh, I like to keep it simple. So I use a scale of one to 10. One is what you're doing right now, you know, um, sitting here listening to me. Ten would be like me earlier when I was doing the whole wheezing thing, right? Um, basically meaning you can't keep this, this effort up any longer. So don't forget about progression. So a lot of times when I talk about this, people say, oh, great, I haven't worked out in five years, but I'm going to go ahead and, and start doing 30, 30 minutes of high-intensity interval training and they make it about five minutes into it and their muscles cramp and, and uh, you know, they're so, their faces are beat red, they're so beat down uh, and sore that they don't come back for another two weeks. Right? That's probably not gonna be a good idea. Uh, what we need to do is start out, at, uh, it's better to start at not enough, not enough intensity and work your way up to, you know, what you feel will be good for you. Avoid Uncle Rabdo. Now, the CrossFit people have termed this, uh, I don't know if it's a, considered a disease or, or a symptom or something, but it's a uh, rhabdomyolysis, and it's a very serious condition. Um, it was mostly found in elderly people who would fall down and couldn't get up, and uh, nobody was around to help them. So they would put extreme effort trying to get back up that Literally, when, when ra this rhabdomyolysis myolysis occurs, the cellular contents of your muscles explode and go flood into your blood system, 
and your body can't um, filter all this stuff out, um, what happens is you, you have extreme soreness, your muscles swell up, and your urine turns cola colored. Um, this happens to people who are exercising now because of this whole boot camp uh, phenomenon of CrossFit and all that kind of stuff. CrossFit is super famous for it and that's what they've termed to Uncle Rabdo. Um, it, and it's a, it is a very serious condition. When you have this, you're going to spend you know, a week in the hospital. Um, it can kill you. Simple, a sample hit program for the treadmill. So this is one you can take home and use if you can run. Uh, the first minute you're going to jog, it's going to be an RPE, meaning how, how hard is this to you, about a level six. The second minute, this is where the work comes in. You're going to sprint. And what I mean by sprint is, yeah, it's 100% maximal effort. A lot of times I'll tell people this and they'll say, oh, I sprinted and I used, you know, six and a half miles an hour. And I said, well, what were you jogging at or running at before when you would do a 45 minute jog? Well, six miles an hour. I'm like, well, you're only keeping this up for a minute. You could probably do more. This should be on a level 10. Then you get a reward. You get a two minute walk. And it's not just a, a walk where you're like, that was hard. You know, it's going to be a brisk walk. It, you should allow you to get your breath back, but you should still be sweating. Your heart rate should still be up. Then you're going to uh, reward yourself with another hard run for two minutes this time. So let's say your first minute sprint was at about you know, uh, 11 miles an hour. It's what I used to do. Um, the second run that's going to be for two minutes, if you can also do that at 11 miles an hour, well, your first run wasn't hard enough. Um, this, you'll probably have to step it down to you know, a mile to a mile and a half an hour slower because you are keeping up for a longer period of time. At about a minute and a half of this, you should feel like you want to die and you want to quit. But, you know, you're going to keep it up for another 30 seconds because, like, what I do to keep myself going is I pretend someone's behind me holding a gun to my back. And if I stop, they're going to shoot me. And if that was true, would I keep going? Eh, probably. Um, but then you get to reward yourself for another, with another brisk walk. So it's, it's two minutes, again, a brisk walk. Get your heart rate back. Get your breath back. Um, and then you're going to do another hard run. So let's say your second, your, or your first hard run was eight and a half miles an hour. You probably, or you shouldn't be able to duplicate that on your next hard run. If you could, then your first one wasn't hard enough. Um, so you might have to back it off to like say 7.8 or eight miles an hour. And those are just arbitrary numbers based on what I used to do. Then after that, for uh, after 10 minutes, you're just going to cool down to where your heart rate's you know pretty darn close to normal. Strength training, my favorite. So is this another form of interval training? Think about it. When, if you do strength training, typically we'll do like a, let's say bench press, we'll do a set of like say 10 to 20 reps, then what do we do? We rack it and wait a little bit and then hit it again, right? So yeah, it's definitely another form of interval training, which means strength training is very, very powerful fat burner. So don't forget about it. <clears throat> And again, we all heard this, the more muscle you have, the more calories you burn just to maintain your, your, your metabolism. So the low weight, high rep myth. We all have heard, if you want to tone up, you want to lose fat, you got to do low weight and high reps. Okay, well, where, where people f fail on this is they think <coughs> low, low weight means easy weight, okay? It doesn't mean easy weight. What ta happens, people say, okay, I'm going to do 20 reps and I'm going to use, you know, 15 pound dumbbells. And they do their 20, and by the time they're done, they're like that. They're, there's no exhaustion there. Um, that's not going to do anything, uh, or it's going to do very little, anyways. That 20th rep, should, you should barely be able to get it because all the same principles uh, for high, uh, HIT training apply to strength training also. Go for that burn. By the time you're done with your set, it should feel like it burned pretty good. So intensity, go hard. Consistency, be regular. So strength training women, this is a big one. Um, a lot of women, and, and this has been my experience, say, oh, I didn't like doing that exercise because it made my arms bulky. How many times did you do it? Twice? I'm like, oh, okay. Really, it's kind of probably in your head. Um, so don't worry, girls. You won't become a She-Hulk, okay? Um, 
this, unless you're taking a slew of steroids, and even then you probably you, know, you probably won't turn green at least. Um, yeah. So women, they're just not uh, geared like men. So yes, you can get bigger muscles. It's actually a good thing. Um, it, it, again, we talked about it. And the more muscle you have, the more calories you burn, all that kind of good stuff. There are limitations. Okay, genetics. We talked about that. That's your biggest limiter. Um, if you have the genetic potential to gain bigger muscles, well then, yeah, you might be a, a stocky girl. But uh, you know what? That's you. Get get over it. Be okay with it. Women don't have the same amount of testosterone as guys, so that obviously that's going to be a big limiter to how much muscle you can gain. Um, think about it this way too: if you need to lose fat and you lose this much fat but gain this much muscle, are you going to be smaller? Are you going to lose some weight? Most likely. If you lose say your goal is 30 pounds but you only lose 25 you gain five pounds of muscle at the point uh, during that time you are going to shrink you are going to look better and you're going to be more healthy consistency so this is another uh, thing you need to do to maximize your workout for fat loss i like to call it frequently consistent okay because if we work out once a month for a year for 12 months straight that's that's pretty consistent right but is it enough to, is it frequent enough to produce the results? This is the biggest factor for results. So what's the right amount of frequency? You know, so how many times a week should I work out? I get this question all the time. Is it once a week? Is it, you know, three times a week, five times a week, eight times a week, nine times a week? You know, what is it? Eight times, nine times, that's impossible. I see people out there, nine times a week? Okay, wow. Um, remember progression, okay? Your, your body will adapt to the least amount of unaccustomed activity. I got that from the Resistance Training Specialist Program. That's the RTSM thing I talked about earlier. Um, if you haven't been doing anything except for eating bonbons every night and flipping a remote control, getting up and walking around the block three times a week is probably going to be a good first step, right? Um, your body will adapt to that fairly quickly, but now all of a sudden, okay, instead of doing one, one round of... Uh, walk around the block, do two, you know, progress. And make it the smallest steps possible. Again, always keep in mind, it's important, that your body, body will adapt to the least amount of unaccustomed activity. Frequency stoppers, these are obstacles. These are things that keep you from going to the gym, keep you from doing your workouts, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> Think of these as speed bumps. They're meant to slow you down, not stop you, okay? so. Uh, just the other day, um, I'm about ready to work out. I get a phone call from my wife. My daughter accidentally swallowed some glass in this easy bake oven that she got and uh, had to take her to the emergency room. So I didn't get to work out that day. What well, does that mean? I take it, you know, and go home, park the car in the garage, shut the door, and start it up because I, I missed my workout? No, it just slowed me down. I got back into it the next day, and here I am, I'm still in shape. So don't worry about it so much. There are things to be worried about though, uh, concerned about I guess, is because even stopping for a short period of time, and I've done this myself, worked out for two years straight, had a month where I didn't work out, and then I said, well I should get back in the gym, and it's six months later, eight months later, and I still haven't done it, because it's so easy, it's way easier not to go to the gym than it is to actually go there, or do your workout. So what's your minimum frequency? This is important. You should need to establish a rule to say, okay, I am going to work out no less than three times a week. And that's, that's my minimum number right now. I typically work out five to six times a week. Um, but through holidays and things like that, as long as I get in three, I know I'm going to be okay. No consistency equals no results equals no motivation. We've lost our motivation. Remember, motivation is the first thing that's going to uh, get us to want to change our lives, to get up and, and make that move, to, to make our plan. These aren't exact numbers, but you know, we, there's a lot of research out there that shows that it, basically it takes a longer time to create a habit than it does to lose it. Uh, why is that? Because our bodies like lazy. It, it likes easy, right? So that's just human nature. We're human, so it, it's okay. It's comfortable and easy. <clears throat> so consistency. This doctor is talking to this guy. He says, what fits your busy schedule better? Exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? Okay, worst case scenarios, right? 
So what can we do to overcome obstacles? Okay, this is part of our plan. This is part of what we do. We set out before we even start working out. We can make a calendar. We can make a, a, write a workout journal. We can find a workout partner with that, and that's a huge one. Create some accountability. Build. <coughs> one other thing you need to uh, always do is build your workout regimen around your schedule and available equipment. So if you don't have a gym membership, you're probably not going to be using a, a Nautilus Select, right? You know, vertical chest press. Um, Building it around your schedule is hugely important. I meet with people all the time and we're establishing a weekly exercise structure and they've never worked out before or it's been many, uh, many years since they have and they say, I want to come in five days a week. And I say, well, how busy is your day right now? Are you, uh, is there any hour where you're sitting around going, God, I wish I had something to do. I'm so bored, you know. Maybe there's days like that, but most of us, our days are filled 24 hours a day, including sleep, right? Um, including personal time, all that kind of stuff. So when you start adding work, uh, exercise into your regimen, we can't make time. There's only 24 hours in a day. We have to start sacrificing some things. Um, so work, build your workout regimen around your schedule. Don't try to force yourself to work out. I've done this, I've seen it a million times. Someone says, oh, I don't have time, but, but I'm gonna make myself. I'm, my mother-in-law does this all the time. She, she creates a new plan about every three weeks or so because the other one didn't work. And she says, well, I'm just going to do this plan and I'm going to make myself do it. Well, she's creating a new plan every three weeks because she can't make herself do it. She's not building things around her workout, her, her schedule. The other thing you could do is you could hire a trainer. You know, a lot of times people come to me and create, you know, uh, hire me to, to train them, not because they need that motivation, they need that push. What they need is, hey, I've put some money into this thing, I've invested in it, so it's gonna make me go there, you know. Um, that's the accountability for them. Have a plan. This, this uh, trainer's plan here says, today we're gonna do an hour of cardio, an hour of weights, and two hours of Photoshop. <laughs> um, that plan is huge. You gotta, you gotta make that plan. Plan to succeed. Set yourself up for success, right? We talked that story. We talked about it first. Abraham Lincoln, all that. Sharpen your axe. You know, spend some time to create a quality plan. Um, fight for it, also, because once you make this plan, what's going to happen? Everybody's going to need your attention. There's going to be life things that happen that that get in your way. You know, uh, I tell clients all the time: be selfish about this, and I'm serious. Be selfish. When someone says, hey, can, you know, can you give me a ride somewhere? Sure, after my workout, you know, because you are important. This is the, what a lot of people forget. They're, they're busy doing things for other people. They sacrifice their, their life for doing favors for other people, doing errands for other people, sacrifice their life for work. But who gets, who gets lost in the mix? Who do they forget about? They forget about yourself, you know. And a year later, you've gained 30 pounds, or your cholesterol is going through the roof, you're on blood pressure medications. Don't forget about yourself. Your workout time, draw solid, two, double solid yellow lines around that, you know, like, like, a, like a, a, in, in, the, in the road. If you see a, a double solid yellow line, are you supposed to go across that? No, right? If the cop sees you, he can give you a ticket or whatever. That's you time, okay? We all need that. It, it could be meditation, it could be exercise, it could be anything. We need you time. Be selfish about it. So if you want more information on all this, you can visit my website, which is matrixfited.com. Remember, not Matrix Fighted, not a fight club. Um, I do have a weekly blog that I post, which has you know, some exercise science articles ranging from you know, biomechanical uh, evaluation of resistance. Um, I also have you know, uh, uh, an article up there that talks about you know, three exercises you can do at the gym for a great uh, fat burning workout. So there's always new content up there <coughs> that you can actually read and go apply yourself. Um, if you subscribe to our newsletter, you'll get a free ebook which actually has um, detailed out how to create a good plan, um, your, your fitness success plan. And there's lots of other information on there. And, that's it. So I want to thank you guys for coming and listening to me. Um, hopefully it wasn't that boring. <laughs>